Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, even in the disciplines of anthropology, for quite some time, uh, there has been a lot of uh, differences and disagreements upon the demarcations or the boundaries between nature and culture or nature and society. And even among the uh, anthropologists, for quite some time, uh, this nature and culture or nature and society is seen to be uh, something different and uh, the works of uh, Julian Stewart once he come up with the idea of this uh, cultural ecology uh, some sort of a dualism has been uh, realized if not uh, seen in the context of the relations between uh, nature and society. Uh, in today's lecture, we would be looking at uh, the theme of uh, what I call as paradigms in human environmental relations and within this, we would be looking at the three paradigms which is developed by uh, an anthropology, Gisli Palson, uh, a professor in anthropology of uh, who is based in Iceland. Now, he has in a way uh, developed three paradigms namely uh, Orientalism, Paternalism and Communalism. And uh, he has actually tried to condense uh, different uh, sort of ideas in looking at how these three paradigms is uh, overlap at the same time the kind of differences among them and it is sort of an attempt to find out an, al an alternative ways of uh, trying to locate the relationship between uh, human and environment in general and nature and culture. So, it also tries to look at uh, the different trends of how uh, the evolution of uh, or the development, so to say, in the modern parlance is in a way looked at. Now, mostly if you look at uh, the, the kind of uh, engagement uh, in today's uh, modern context, uh, the ecologists are more, more or less being sort of uh, looking at the theme of this ecology in general. and. And, and to some extent, their main engagement is uh, in trying to uh, sort of demarcate from the other disciplines of uh, social sciences. Now, they, they, they in, this, in this pursuit, they tend to compare the order of nature as if uh, they were in a way uh, sort of uh, separated and also uh, which are being autonomous and in some way the ecologists also engage in trying to look at the link between these two. Now, this is per perhaps what uh, Holing and others tries to observe. Now, given this context, uh, even if there is a sort of a dialectic uh, uh, which, which, which in a way engages by certain kinds of uh, using certain jargons and there has been a continuous boundary or demarcation which is being seen in the context of this society and nature and which 
happens to be uh, a topic of contestation uh, for quite some time as I said. Now, uh, way back in the 1970s, there was sort of uh, a path breaking uh, things which happened and that was when Salins, Marshall Salins, another anthropologist uh, sort of uh, categorized this anthropology which in a way is a discipline which is trapped between this idealism and materialism and which in a way is a prisoner pacing between the farthest walls of his cells, which in a way engaged in trying to reinvent uh, the allegory of what uh, the cave from Plato's Republic. Now, in a way, if you look at anthropology in general, uh, what uh, Pelson also critically argues in this uh, particular <coughs> paper which I am relying on and what he says is anthropology is mostly uh, based on those colonial ideas if not the western objectivist, the western science objectivist and they tend to you know uh, uh, report if not write about other cultures from their perspective and not from the host community. So, that sort of uh, ideas or uh, biasness was prevalent even uh, in the domain or in the discipline of anthropology and uh, uh, there, there, there has been uh, a strong critic or uh, something made on the anthropology as if it is the bastard child of uh, colonialism. Now, in some way uh, this sort of uh, engagement which the anthropologist has also encountered needs to be relooked and re-examined and what is the kind of uh, differences if not the missing link between when the someone study a particular community. Now, if you look at uh, the social theory. Uh, there is this organic individual which in a way is often contrasted with the uh, collective life and uh, the form of that is the individual which in a sense is assumed as part of nature while the, the uh, collective is seen to be super organic. When, when, we, when we say super organic, we are talking about the larger domain, the larger picture if not the culture which in a way uh, guides a particular society. So, this sort of organic and super organic in a way or maybe uh, uh, this sort of dichotomous relationship between uh, the individual and uh, the collective social life in a way can be replicated when we study the relationship between nature and society if not uh, the human environmental relationship. Now, we will we'll try to look at uh, the kind of distinctions uh, wh which is made between uh, nature and society. Now, one of the key uh, modernist <coughs> discourse uh, which is being constructed uh, over the past uh, decades have in a way increasingly uh, been the a subject of uh, discussion in several fields including this uh, anthropology and environmental history. Now, this nature and society uh, for quite some time happens to be uh, sort of a hot debate uh, not just between uh, among the sociologists or anthropologists, but across uh, different disciplines and uh, primarily anthropology and environmental history. Now, there are different methods which are being used, the kind of approach, paradigms to understand or to locate this uh, dichotomy if not the dualism which exists between nature and society and Marxian approach uh, is one such uh, wherein 
there is a restriction uh, which, which is res primarily restricted to human relations uh, and uh, which is to look at the human environmental uh, analysis. So, uh, in the study of Depper, if you look at wherein he uh, argued that these particular communities uh, who engage in uh, foraging, that is hunting and gathering societies, usually humans and animals tends to engage in a mutual production of each other's existence. Now, by saying this mutual production, we mean to say uh, that one party becoming the producers and the others becoming the products. So, in, in this is sort of a continuous engagement between the environment, if not uh, so called animals, which usually the hunters uh, rely on. So, this is one of the ideas which Tapers has developed. Now, this Marxian approach in a way can be helpful in the looking at the uh, analysis of this uh, the human environmental relations in some way, because it tends to uh, begin looking at the kind of economic productions uh, and uh, man usually engages the first form of uh, his relations with the environment is economic in nature and in the earlier lectures we also talks about that uh, the economic man how uh, an individual by being an economic man engages oneself in the environment. Now, uh, similar to what Tapers has uh, observed, uh, Brightman in a way uh, tends to look at uh, the case of this the Canadian Cree uh, in which the humans and animals uh, successively participate as producers and other animals willing to surrender as that is the product of their own bodies and the hunters in a way uh, returning to them as a cook food all figure in idiom of love. So, this sort of uh, metaphorical or sort of uh, ideational relations which exist between human and the environment in a way is based on uh, a continuous engagement of what is called love or, or we can in a way say they are being dependent uh, of each other. Now, from the Cree experience and which we have in a way uh, discussed at length in the <coughs> preceding lectures about how the Cree people or the Cree hunters uh, engage uh, in their economic pursuit that is for their sustenance. Now, it is interesting to in a way observe that how this sort of uh, symbiotic relationship is being established between the humans that is the hunters and the animals, wherein that sort of uh, understanding, mutual understanding exists between the two, because uh, the human in a way playing the role of that a producer and the animals in a way voluntarily sacrificing as the product, because unless the animal sacrifice itself uh, and of course, the human needed for a foodstuff. So, that sort of uh, relationship is established and uh, what uh, Brightman has uh, quite eloquent, eloquently put it as uh, you know an idiom of love. So, one entity has to sacrifice in order for the other entity to exist or continue. So, this sort of processual engagement of human and environment relationship is something which we would be looking at. Now, uh, the three paradigms which is developed by uh, Pelsons uh, is uh, 
Orientalism, Paternalism and Communism. And these three paradigms in a way uh, are different in nature and they uh, sort of uh, the earlier two uh, Orientalism and Paternalism are slightly uh, close enough and they are similar because uh, it rejects the radical separation of uh, nature and society uh, because uh, sorry uh, the communalism is different from the two because it tends to reject the radical idea of the separation of nature and society object and subject and which rather tends to uh, sort of uh, prefer pre give, give the preference of this notion of dialogue. Now, and there is sort of uh, an interface wherein these all these relations uh, can be exist that is between a nature and society object and subject. Now, this separation um, can be in a way removed if not negotiated. This is what uh, this paradigm of communalism in a way believe and tries to look at. Now, if you look at the, the kind of ethical approaches uh, in the making sense of the environment that is the human environmental relations are in a way highly connected. Now, this sort of uh, ideas in a way has developed uh, to many uh, scholars or who have a con 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 continuous engagement in this sort of uh, paradigms. Now, Marchand uh, in 1990 has in a way applied a uh, sort of a taxonomy that is uh, a classification uh, of plants, animals, so on and so forth uh, for this human environment relationship and also come up with this environmental ethics which tends to sort of distinguish between the egocentric uh, the homocentric and the ecocentric approaches. Now, in this environmental ethics, it tends to look at the innate uh, sort of relations or uh, understanding between the human and environment. And Merchant has contributed significantly by firstly trying to come up with this uh, idea of this taxonomy that is classification. Uh, now, the first one that uh, what egocentric uh, talks about. Now, Marchand in a way suggests that this egocentric approach is uh, grounded on the self and uh, lies fear capitalism. Now, it is interesting to see that the modern trends of how human in a way tends to share a relationship with their environment in this uh, egocentric approach wherein the self becomes uh, the most important thing and in logic fear capitalism you could actually see that how the uh, state is not allowed to sort of intervene in the interest of uh, those who pursue their individual interest. So, in a way you can see this uh, as a free enterprise and where is wherein individualism is given so much importance. Now, this is what uh, the egocentric approach tries to espouse and the second one that is the homocentric one, it is grounded uh, in society, it, it is more of uh, the sort of relations or dualism which exists between members of and the society and it tries to look at uh, the idea of the stewardship that is uh, one's engagement in caring and nurturing. So, it is interesting to look at uh, even uh, in this idea or approach one can actually try to locate these notions of uh, stewardship that is how an individual is engaged in engaged in this homocentric ideas. And, and finally, if you look at in the ecocentric approach which strongly addresses uh, the whole uh, sort of 
uh, universe or the environment which assign certain kind of an intrinsic value to even the non-human uh, nature. That is, it, it tra tends to sort of recognize the existence of uh, other species as well. It is more of holistic in approach. Now, you can see these three differences. Uh, uh, the firstly with that is the egocentric which talks about the self interest that is primarily based on the individualism and in a modern context uh, the most suitable example is the laissez sphere capitalism and uh, we talk, which talks about the free market and uh, in, in, in individualism and free market you could actually see uh, a lot of competition. Now, uh, usually uh, mankind engage in some kind of competition or in competition among the other members. Now, in the homocentric one, it, it, it sort of uh, tries to espouse uh, sort of uh, an idea of being paternalistic that is which talks about as if one has the rights of engaging in uh, caring and nursing that is stewardship. And the uh, third one that is finally that uh, the ecocentric approach in a way tends to you know give respect the mutual existence of every species that is every species has the right of uh, being uh, in their own that is uh, you tends to value the intrinsic value of uh, the kind of relationship which is shared between human and uh, nature. Now, it is important to uh, situate or look at this nature society relationship uh, in history and uh, some of the ethnographic accounts. Uh, if, if one does not look at uh, or locate, situate this nature society in the history, it will be difficult for us to you know uh, talk about even the modern context. Now, there are some works which are being done during the medieval Europe, uh, wherein they closely observed and looked at the kind of relationship which is shared between nature and society. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, usually uh, there was no sort of demarcation or uh, a radical separation between the two, uh, even uh, during in, in, in medieval Europe. Now, if you look at the works of Guribeck, he argues that in medieval times, man tends to presume himself or thought of himself as an integral part of the world. That is, that sort of biocentric ideas uh, evolve around uh, human. That is, they are part of uh, sort of nature. That that sort of cosmology was uh, being uh, inherent in that particular time. Now, his interrelations in a way with nature was so intensive and thorough that he could not look at it from without, he was inside it. Which means, he does not look at nature as separate, but rather as, uh, as if human is part of nature. That is it does not tends to sort of draw, draw a boundary and there is no radical separation. This is what the study of uh, Gurevic uh, espouse. Now, it is also interesting to see that this sort of uh, interrelations which in which the individual stands to posit himself not outside, but within that is to locate oneself as a part of nature. So, that sort of dualism or that uh, symbiotic relationship which exists between nature and human is pretty much evident in the context of uh, Gurevic study of these medieval times, when human tends to assume himself to be sort of uh, an integral part of uh, the world. That is human is uh, one entity in the whole cosmos. 
Now, the particular time term called individuals uh, originally meant indivisible, that which cannot be divided like the unity of the trinity. Now, the idea of the use of this particular jargons like individual in medieval times and the modern uh, contemporary period is different. Now, as uh, uh, I had pointed out uh, how in ecocentric the idea of this legisphere uh, capitalism uh, is being posited wherein there is a free market, free competition. You talk about individualism and uh, you talk about your self interest, but the use of this particular term individual in medieval times in a way uh, talks about indivisible that is uh, one is pretty much embedded in the system or part of it that it cannot be really removed out or one cannot be seen or talk about in isolation. So, that is the kind of uh, usage or the jargons which is normally used in medieval times when they talk about individual that is nothing but indivisible. So, it can be looked at as the unity of the trinity. So, it is sort of like uh, one cannot exist alone or in isolation, so, it has to be sort of uh, existence a collective it believes in collective existence. Now, this sort of uh, systematic fragmenting of the medieval world and ordering of nature, when we talk about ordering of nature. Uh, we are in a way referring it to something different that is in separation. Now, this sort of fragmenting of this medieval world and the ordering of nature in a way tends to you know entails the kind of uh, what renaissance period uh, looked at. Remember uh, how the idea of this renaissance takes place way back in the 14th century and it began in Italy and during which uh, those artisans painters in a way tends to portray the sort of uh, the divine understanding if not the glor glorification of those godly designs. So, they were in a way playing a very you know important class or uh, held a very important positions in uh, Europe at that point of time. So, in this the whole idea of this renaissance period uh, was to in a way transform if not the idea of this western attitude. Uh, for instance, their whole idea about the environment the knowledge and learning was in a way uh, dramatically transformed it tries to you know espouse some sort of a transition uh, and, and for, for, for instance if you talk about the renaissance painters they were pretty much uh, skillfully trained and, uh, and, and their notion of these uh, ideas were based on this the Aristotelian philosophy and uh, the medieval church. Now, this holistic understanding or engagement uh, in trying to uh, espouse the idea of knowledge was pretty much uh, rampant in western Europe at that point of time. Now, uh, this is something which we can sort of uh, categorize as a Cartesian anxiety. A Cartesian is nothing but which is primarily based on uh, the idea of French philosopher that is Ren Descartes and uh, Descartes in a way uh, often talks about the lo logical analysis and mechanical mechanistic interpretations of physical nature. So, this is the ideas what uh, Ren Descartes uh, usually tends to look at that is uh, he rely on not simply uh, a subjective 
uh, idea or, or a mere hypothesis, but based on the logical analysis and mathematical mechanistic interpretation of uh, physical nature. That is, it believes in an objectivist notion of ideas. Now, what is this Cartesian anxiety then? Cartesian anxiety in a way is talks it talks about the hope that studying the world will give us unchangeable knowledge of ourselves and the world. Now, it is interesting to see that because it is not based on a mere uh, subjective ideas or notion of thinking, but rather if one engages in using this uh, sort of a holistic approach of understanding, this Cartesian anxiety in a way will uh, give uh, a very holistic understanding or if not a rational understanding of what happens around the world. So, this knowledge will remain uh, unchangeable. Now, uh, this is how we tend to contextualize and understand ourselves uh, in the context in the domain of this uh, uh, universe. Now, this Cartesian anxiety in a way also talks about uh, the estrangement and uncertainty. However, this separation from the mother world of the middle ages and the nursing art was to be to some extent compensated for uh, this rational ego that is the obsession of this objectivity and a masculine theory of natural knowledge. Now, when we looked at this uh, uh, idea of a rational ego and uh, the obsession with objectivity and masculine theory of natural knowledge. These are partly some of the Cartesian uh, anxiety talks about that is the estrangement and uncertainty and the separation from uh, the mother world of the middle ages and nursing art. So, art is not seen as uh, no more addressed as mother art or not something which is seen as caring and nurturing rather it talks about uh, seeing things uh, the whole idea attitude uh, to environment in a way has transformed and changed as we said uh, beginning from the renaissance period. Now, how is the world or the art in a way being uh, perceived after this period that is the renaissance period and uh, what we generally understood as the Cartesian anxiety. Now, the art in a way is being addressed as C that is nature in a way becomes it and it can be understood and controlled. Now, that is what we are talking about othering of nature. You are in a way uh, engaging in a radical separation of human and nature or society and nature. Now, when you use that particular term as it, it in a way uh, can be sort of understood and controlled and not by using uh, sympathy, but, by, but by, by the very virtue or the notion of this objectivity of the it that is the otherness of nature is now what allows to be known. This is something uh, usually classified by Bordeaux. Now, this sort of separation, the demarcation which is being uh, transformed, the idea or the perceptions which is transformed of uh, addressing or per perception of nature has immensely sort of transformed the relations between in a way the human and nature. For example, if you look at uh, if nature as another it has to be in a way translated. It needs an explanation since it relies on uh, rationality or objectivity. So, much like 
what the sort of the fall of the Babel Tower was looked at the noise in the ruins of in the ruins of this tower. It demands a close attention and effort at understanding. So one needs to go back and looked at history. So, one needs to have a glimpse of history in order to come with certain kind of a rational explanation in this context. Now, a translation in a way indicates the relative submissiveness or superiority of the translator. What happens uh, when there is a, uh, a translation uh, being processed? So, the translation of uh, translator obviously have an upper hand uh, and the authority of you know the receptor vis a vis the source because he in a way would translate uh, things in a way he like so there is a chances of you know distorting facts at the same time uh, uh, one one can sometime rely on concoction so this sort of uh, uh, you know the lacuna cannot be ruled out in the context of when this translation uh, takes place. Now, this is also primarily one of the problem which is being encountered in the context of the ethnographic accounts of those colonialists, wherein they tend to you know uh, translate or look at the native societies from the, the western uh, objectivist or those rational scientist perception. So, therefore, this sort of translation when uh, it involves a certain kind of uh, problems which is usually encountered. So, this kind of uh, perspective in a way are uh, usually being applied in the ethnographic and the price what is doing what is ethnography and what is uh, doing an ethnography usually uh, anthropologists and sociologists mainly engage in the a long durations of exposure to an unknown culture or society and uh, tries to collect data and uh, trying to look at the culture of different societies and tends to interpret. So, there is a sort of a translation which again uh, uh, looked into because those uh, scholars who are in the field would try to amass certain kind of data, they translate and trans transcribe and translate those uh, information. So, sometime those information are the chances of being manipulated. Now, uh, this is what Pelson has observed, wherein I quote uh, how ethnographers in a way as a visitors or a guest meet their host that is the society what one is studying and how they are met by them and how they manage their lives among them and how they report what they have experienced varies from case to case. Now, for instance, uh, if you look at uh, the colonial ethnographic accounts, uh, many of the reports which they normally write about uh, many native societies are today being uh, challenged and uh, debunked by the regional scholars themselves. For instance, uh, they, they tend to use those uh, jargons which are never part of that particular culture because those are more, more or less based on a preconceived uh, notion of ideas because you tend to impose that particular thing on them that is uh, the host community. So, the kind of interaction the first interaction or the kind of impression which is being posited on the host community is how the ethnographers engage in uh, their report primarily from their kind of experiences. Now, uh, since uh, the two that is the guest and the host 
comes under different settings or different experience or different cultural backgrounds. So, the uniformity or the interface of these two in a way would you know sometimes bring out a uh, negative result. So, that is something which cannot be ruled out and this is what we talk about in this the ethnographic enterprise that is in translation. Now, the, I, the whole idea of this orientalism and paternalism in a way is also embedded in this kind of perception. Now, interestingly what Pelson is trying to also bring in is how this sort of uh, translation is involved in this ethnographic study is also similar to the kind of approaches what ones look at between the, the relationship between nature and society. And in this environmental orientalism and paternalism, there has been a uh, sort of a contrast uh, perception that is the dominant perception, uh, per perception of domination and protect, protection with respect to the environment. Now, this contrast that is domination and protection uh, is also something which needs to be looked at. The key difference uh, between the orientalism and paternalism is that while the former that is exploits the latter protects. So, this is something which uh, we have to look at. Now, again this environmental orientalism in a way suggests certain kind of uh, uh, negative uh, reciprocity in human to environmental relationship. And what is this negative recipro reciprocity? And whereas this uh, paternalism in a way implies a uh, kind of a balance reciprocity that is a sort of a dualism which exists between the two. And uh, paternalism in a way uh, presupposes this human responsibility that is uh, the kind of uh, responsibility on the part of human to uh, care for this nature or sort of uh, caring and nurturing uh, responsibility is being uh, on them. Now, however, the in both the cases, this there is an assumption as uh, idea of what is known as uh, a masculinity attitude or uh, the nature of or the perception of being a masculine that is the mastery of the masters of nature. That, that is as if human have uh, that sort of capacity if not the responsibility of being a master of nature. That is nature is something which needs to be protected and controlled. So, that sort of authority is being uh, self bestowed on human. Now, uh, uh, different from what uh, orientalism and paternalism talks about communalism in a way uh, looked at differently that is the third paradigm that communalism in a way emerged tends to reject this idea of uh, a radical separation between nature and society and also between object and subject. So, in communalism there is no demarcation between what is objective and subjective or if not object and subject and uh, this idea of uh, the modernist uh, assumption of othering that is separation, certainty and monologue uh, adding the dimensions of this continuity and discontinuity. Sometime uh, this mo the western modernist idea of uh, you know perceiving things is uh, and, and sort of demarcation is as if at one point at, at one stage they have come out of the natural order that is they are no more part of the nature. nature. And uh, by classifying some communities or group as uh, permanently still embedded or close to nature. 
So, this sort of attitude uh, of declaring oneself to be no longer associated with nature is also something which has to do with uh, this idea of discontinuity. And whereas, the, uh, there is this dimensions of community of a particular group, where they are still uh, in continuous engagement with nature. So, this sort of uh, differences uh, of uh, the binaries or dichotomies which exist between um, the subject and object continuity and discontinuity are something which communalism uh, in a way reject. So, this paradigm in a way uh, strongly suggest a kind of a generalized uh, reciprocity in this human environmental relations, which in a way tries to invoke the notions of this contingency, participation and dialogue. So, until unless one tends to uh, participate that is to see things in context, to contextualize oneself, there will be no scope for uh, and deeper understanding or analysis if not a dialogue between all this. Therefore, uh, this sort of uh, similarities which exist in the human world and this the natural environment uh, is sort of seen as similar that is the analogy between the human world and uh, these ideas. Now, humans uh, often uh, treat other human beings as uh, and the environment in a similar manner and indeed the discourse on nature that is ethnography and textual translation have much in common. Now, the kind of uh, how we treat our fellow human beings is also similar with the kind of how we treat the environment. So, uh, if you talk about the uh, modern ideas of uh, class system, the inequality, economic inequality and the kind of uh, sort of ethnocentric ideas which we have, the kind of discrimination which we have towards our fellow beings in a way also sometime matters uh, and that is how we tends to perceive and looked at the environment, because uh, you, you tends to draw some kind of uh, a self interest if not egocentric ideas of approach in looking things or locating that kind of relationship. Now, therefore, this the discourse on nature that is uh, the kind of uh, relations between human and nature. Uh, is also in a way uh, ethnographic uh, and textual. So, this sort of this translation uh, has occupies or maxims in terms of looking at the idea of uh, this human environment relations again. Thus, uh, this particular use of this uh, the metaphoric language uh, again is a classic rhetoric because uh, for example, if you take the jargons, the metaphors like irony, tragedy, comedy and romance, all this in a way partly if not wholly uh, has appeared in a wide range of fields and contexts at different points of time. And in a way by using this, you are trying to connect or relating yourself with nature. So, unconsciously this sort of metaphorical uses is sort of uh, uh, rhetorical in nature, because this is how the human cannot afford to be you know like uh, seen in isolations or different from uh, what the environment is. This metaphoric association in a way draws upon the language of this personal relatedness of sort of kinship and uh, sexual relationship, which have often been used to represent both 
textual translation and nature society interface. So, this nature society interrelations or interface in a way allows us or sort of guided us into uh, this textual translation. Now, for instance, uh, if uh, you may recall uh, the poem which was being written by William Wordsworth when he talks about the daffodils. Uh, Wordsworth in a very fine day tends to visit the countryside and encounter this uh, wild flowers called the daffodils and tends to look at the kind of movement uh, it is moving uh, uh, <coughs> heaving away like uh, because of the strong wind. Now, that sort of assumptions was Wordsworth was pretty much enchanted by that particular movement of that uh, daffodils that he end up composing and tends to compare with uh, the kind of uh, relate himself with nature. Now, that sort of uh, romanticizing of nature in a way again is how we tends to you know relate ourselves that is the nature society interface or human nature interface sometime result to certain kind of this textual translation. The way we tends to you know translate or romanticize this particular uh, uh, sort of idea and this is sort of a metaphoric associations which normally where, where we tends to draw the language and this personal sorry relatedness. Now, this sort of uh, ideas is something which we would like to look at. Now, what is this uh, orientalist exploitation then? Uh, this paradigm uh, that is orientalist exploitation not only establishes a fundamental break between nature and society, but it also suggests uh, that uh, people are masters of nature and uh, who are responsible uh, to sort of take care of this world that is in charge of the world. Now, as uh, Tim in, in gold has said, uh, he has observed that in the colonial world that is the colonial regime, the world becomes a tabula rasa for the incri inscription of human history. What is tabula rasa then? It is sort of uh, wherein there is no preconceived notion of ideas or prescribed ideas, it, it is sort of uh, a blank note, a blank sheet. So, as if in this colonial regime, the world becomes a tabula rasa for the inscription of human history. So, the human history ideally sort of begin uh, as colonialism uh, advances. Now, this uh, sort of predetermined if not uh, the human mind or the human history in a way was uh, a blank slit at that point of time uh, before the pre colonial uh, encounters. So, once this colonial encounters takes place uh, those ethnograph ethnographic accounts by those anthropologists and uh, colonialists in a way has sort of emerged as the foundation of the history of the many communities. So, therefore, in this particular colonial regime, uh, there has been a changes, a transformation of uh, or uh, the history has uh, been uh, rewritten by the colonialist. Now, in some way we can say that uh, the kind of literature which involve in the, uh, the world is mostly of the colonial uh, writings and even in the Indian context if you look at we are still following many of the uh, colonial regimes practices. If you take the examples of uh, I mean for instance the forest rights, the fo many of the forest rights acts are still 
an extension of the colonialist regime. Now, this sort of classification of forests, trees, all these in a way have begun or sprung up uh, way back in the British colonial period. Now, we still can't do away without this uh, the colonialist hangover because we are still pretty much dependent on our ideas, our uh, notion of thinking has in a way uh, been impregnated because of the colonialist. So, these ideas in a way has begun with our, our comments rather uh, since the period of this uh, the colonial regime. Now, uh, mostly uh, the exploitation if not the ideas of how we tend to assume the nature in a way is also being guided by this sort of uh, the orientalist ideas. So, this is primarily what the orientalist exploitation talks about of how the human in a way tends to you know takes the place of the masteries of nature as if they have this authority or uh, you know power to you know govern the world. Now, this sort of uh, uh, metaphors which are normally being used in orientalism is again uh, sort of uh, one with to do with domestic domestications of frontiers and expansions of exploring conquering exploiting of uh, the environment for the diverse purpose of production consumption sport display and uh, i'm pretty sure that you may know you all know what these vocabularies uh, mean to now for instance conquering exploiting of the environment so many of what we tend to witness even in the present context this whole idea of exploiting or conquering in a way is seen to be uh, with a with the kind of development uh, uh, paradigm which we are following. So, we, we, we still cannot you know come out of this whole idea of how we conceive or tends to look at nature. So, this perception of uh, what we have seen in orientalism is still pretty much continuous that is domestication. For instance, uh, what, what, what do you mean by domestication? It is not just about uh, you know as if you are owning or controlling something, but you have that overriding power over something by sort of domesticating it. Now, similarly you can also talk about uh, the commodification of nature. When you tend to you know commodify a particular thing, you tend to see the uh, external values and you, you tend to compromise by looking at the intrinsic value. So, this sort of perception or ideas are strongly uh, pretty much evident from the kind of vocabularies which are being used. Now, uh, this sort of uh, attitude in a way is pretty much uh, dominant in the context of uh, orientalism. Now, uh, in this particular context that is the orientalist context, the scientists in a way tends to present themselves uh, as an analysis of the material world that is which are in a way uh, perceived to be unaffected by any ethical considerations. Now, in trying to look at the uh, or, or trying to interpret the material world, uh, the orientalist in a way uh, tries to contextualize uh, and they seems to be you know uh, un un remains unperturbed by these ethical considerations. When we talk about ethical consideration, we are also looking at the kind of uh, uh, innate meanings or the intrinsic value of a particular things, but uh, the orientalist in the orientalist context. Uh, the scientist seems to be you know like uh, remain unperturbed by all these happenings or rather any kind of any 
ethical considerations. Now, this persistence, the continuous uh, idea of this othering of the object, for example, uh, from the Baconian imagery of sexual assault of entering and penetrating holes and corners. Now, this sort of uh, what uh, we have seen in the Baconian uh, imagery of this sexual assault, in a way is a persistent uh, continuations of othering of the object, because you tends to use this uh, vocabularies of you know entering and penetrating. Now, if I may recall, uh, you, 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 you can in a way say that many of those uh, hardcore or the radical uh, eco families who tends to uh, explain by using the Marxist approach says that you know the first seduction or objectification of the man engagement with nature is when they tends to use those heavy plows, because the moment the plows uh, get into the soil that is uh, it really tear apart uh, the soil and the art. So, in a way you can see the human forceful engagement in sort of penetrating and also trying to exploit the nature. So, we can in a way use the Baconian imagery of this sexual assault. And then similarly, this, this, is, this, this is tantamount to even the using the term called as if one is engaging in rapping or certain kind of uh, you know a forceful uh, intrusion into the body of something. Now, this is something which is cited in the works of Bordeaux and uh, is a recurrent one. Now, this sort of uh, sort of a sexual exploitation or if not uh, trying to look at uh, the uh, perception of this materialistic or material world can be sort of interesting to see in this light or paradigm. So, therefore, one can you know uh, once you tends to draw the boundary of uh, even the, the gender discrimination if you look at the moment you sort of uh, discriminate between the two and tends to perceive uh, the women as othering you tends to you know like objectified and, and not necessarily seeing it as uh, you know uh, a counterpart or a fellow human being, but rather you are trying to push aside and then objectified and see it as something different. So, therefore, these are some of the kind of uh, current things which are also being uh, continuously witnessed in the contemporary period. Now, as uh, Bordeaux and Nelson father talks about, uh, they have shown in literature on modern science uh, is what replayed the passage with passage and uh, which also describe the human environmental interactions. Uh, by means of an aggressive sexual idioms, which in a way where nature appears as a seductive, but uh, also as a troublesome female. Now, uh, man tends to you know like uh, from a modern science view, uh, the environment, uh, the encounters between human and environment is seen to be you know uh, uh, even if they tends to use this idea of this aggressiveness, it, it tends to see as if the environment is uh, a troublemaker, which is troublesome and which sort of demands the, the scientist or the human to you know like uh, tame them. So, this sort of uh, if, if, if something is a troublemaker and uh, usually it is perceived that it, uh, it needs to be tamed. So, this sort of uh, patriarchal capitalist western mindset in a way is being pretty much uh, espoused in this idea of this modern science. 
so which in a way is tends to be seen uh, by Bordeaux and uh, Nielsen where, where they tends to use the sexual idioms of uh, this aggressiveness or which, which in a way can be seen as a more seductive and uh, troublesome. Now, this sort of patriarchal mindset of you know objectifying or if not the gender discrimination which exists between male and female as if uh, the male that is those modern science were having this inherent uh, power if not authority uh, or they have that rational explanation of uh, using certain elements and forces to control if not team the nature which is perceived to be female. Now, uh, therefore, anthropology is no exception uh, from this modernist uh, western uh, ideas of when it comes to the use of the sexual jargon and uh, predator pre metaphors that is you tends to use or perceive something as uh, a prey and then you are playing a role of a predator. So, this sort of metaphors is something uh, which has been inherent and been used in anthropology uh, for uh, quite some time and uh, Malinowski has to argue in this particular context. For instance, uh, in 1972 he said that the ethnographer in a way has not only to spread uh, the nets in the right place and wait for what will fall into them. He must be an active huntsman and drive his quarry into them and follow it up to its most inaccessible layers. So, this sort of uh, uh, you know uh, as if an ethnographer is engaged in uh, uh, a continuous engagement in the form of hunting or maybe uh, playing the role of a predator or the predator pre sort of uh, interface which is being looked at. I will try to you know uh, move on further with uh, uh, further clarifications in detail in the next lecture. So, till then uh, we can move on to a further explanation of uh, paternalism and communalism uh, in the context of what Pelson has tried to explain. We have uh, quite in depthly look, looked at the orientalist approaches or the orientalist paradigm of human environment relationship and uh, how environment is being perceived from the western modern science perspective and what are the kind of uh, textual translation which in a way also looked at the society nature relationship and mostly we also talk about the kind of metaphors and jargons which are being widely used. So, in a way spelled out and tries to explain the kind of relationship between human and nature. Thank you.